A young man plans elaborate crimes he believes will net him millions of dollars. As he puts his violent schemes in motion, the lives of innocent people and police officers mean nothing. The FBI tries to bring him to justice, but they soon find themselves up against a criminal enterprise. a disguised bank robber hurled explosives at police and disappeared in a hail of bullets. When police identified the suspect, they connected him to an armed kidnapping, but they couldn't find him. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The suspect's behavior was organized, but unpredictable. Everyone leaves a trail, and agents hoped they could pick up the right one. Martinez, California is a suburban city 30 miles north of Oakland. As dawn broke on October 15, 1993, most of Martinez was still asleep. Nobody noticed the dark figure creeping across the rooftop of a downtown bank. He carried a top-of-the-line cordless power saw and drill with special motors that reduced noise. He seemed to know exactly where to cut into the roof. masked man exploited a flaw in the bank's security system. The alarm was unable to detect movement in the crawl space between the roof and the bank's ceiling, allowing him to move freely. Just below was the bank's office. It was rigged with motion sensors. He knew if he descended below, he'd trip the bank's alarm. The masked man also knew bank employees would arrive in a few hours and deactivate the security system. He settled in and waited for them. Hours later, Martina's residents began their morning commutes. Two miles from the Martina's bank, in the city of Pleasant Hill, a police operator answered a seemingly unrelated emergency call. Someone saw two Hispanic males entering a supermarket with guns in their waistbands. Copy that, 220 and it was just before 9 a.m. Pleasant Hill police officer Bob Lauderdale responded to the supermarket. M1, who's the reporting party? He's still on the line, a payphone. Well, my dispatcher advised that the uh, person making the call was calling from a public phone directly across the street from the store. He just hung up. He gave his name as Kyle Farrell. I noticed a black male adult standing in front of the phone booth. He was 
wearing a black varsity type jacket with uh, tan sleeves and carrying a full face motorcycle helmet. Officer Lauderdale and Sergeant Gary Ezell entered the supermarket to investigate. They would begin an aisle by aisle search for the suspects. Back in the city of Martinez, the masked man had waited three hours in the crawl space above the bank's ceiling. Bank employees were preparing to open to the public. They deactivated the alarm when they arrived. The masked man watched a teller punch in her access code to the ATM room, where she would fill the machines with cash. It was his cue for a dramatic entrance. The door automatically locked behind the teller. The robber threatened to kill her co-worker if she didn't open the door. Then he opened it himself. The bank's manager was in the break room. She heard the commotion and glass breaking. Slipped out and called 911. Hurry up, put the money in the bag! Come on! Report of a 211 bank in progress. 6678 Alhambra Avenue. Dispatch Alabama alerted bank. Martinez police. The manager of the bank is advising that she heard someone in the other room shouting, Get your hands up to her tellers. All available units raced to the bank with their sirens off. left with a backpack stuffed full of cash. But to keep it, he'd have to evade Martinez police. Officers arrived at the front of the bank. Martinez and Pleasant Hill Police Departments had only nine officers available to respond. And two of them were tied up on a suspicious call at a supermarket. The robber saw an easy escape, the back of the bank, but he needed a diversion. Martinez traffic officer Earl Moffat moved to cover the rear of the bank. In his 10 years on the force, this would be the first time Officer Moffat would fire his weapon. He's firing rounds at me and he's only about 20 yards away. So it, it, what was going through my mind is just, just chaos. As the gun battle continued, Pleasant Hill police were still investigating the 911 call about two men with weapons entering the supermarket. None of the employees saw anything out of the ordinary. Officer Lauderdale was immediately suspicious. After we were unable to locate anybody matching that description, I thought the uh, bank robbery in Martinez was too big of a coincidence. 
In Martinez, the bank robbery suspect continued his firefight with Officer Moffat. I couldn't copy. His weapon empty, the officer was forced to reload. The gunman used the moment to his advantage. Moffat knew he would be vulnerable to ambush if he climbed over the fence. He followed procedure and called for backup. As officers cordoned off the neighborhood, Martinez police were joined in the investigation by the FBI and Supervisory Special Agent Bob Moore. The FBI automatically investigates all bank robberies. Any crime against those institutions is a federal offense. We have concurrent jurisdiction and traditionally have worked bank robberies very closely with local police. When I first arrived, the scene was quite chaotic. We had been notified that a robbery had occurred and that a gunfight had in, uh, ensued after the robbery. Commander Tom Simonetti supervised the crime scene investigation for Martinez police. At the crime scene, we found shell casings from a Glock 45 pistol, as well as expended uh, rounds that had been fired at our officer. FBI agents know most bank robberies are poorly planned attempts to get drug money. The evidence this robber left behind suggested a more sophisticated criminal. The method of operation was so unique, you just don't see robberies committed every day by people dropping through the roof on, on a rope. On the rooftop, evidence technicians processed the abandoned power tools. They found no fingerprints. Agents interviewed bank employees about their traumatic experience. They described the robber as a muscular black male in a red jacket. The average bank robbery nets just $3,000. The bank manager determined that the robber escaped with over $35,000. And by getting it from the ATM room, no die packs were placed in with the money. Technicians found no fingerprints but discovered a shoe print on the desk where the robber landed. While the crime scene was being processed, Martinez police combed the neighborhood behind the bank for the masked suspect. They soon picked up his trail. It was marked by $20 bills that had fallen from his backpack. But the money trail abruptly ended at the closed end of a cul-de-sac leaving no sign of the suspect. Pleasant Hill police officer Lauderdale was guarding the crime scene when he recognized someone in the crowd of onlookers. And I suddenly noticed that the subject I had seen making the 911 call was now standing in a group of people who were watching the activities at the uh, bank robbery. I thought this was too much of a coincidence, uh, seeing the same subject down at the uh, shopping center and was now at the uh, bank robbery in Martinez. I contacted the subject in order to uh, identify him and find out what he was doing in the area. What are you doing here today? The officer knew the 911 caller at the supermarket gave dispatchers the name of Kyle Farrell. Now the man said his name was Ural Wills. It was suspicious enough for Officer Lauderdale to request the man to go to the police station for questioning. The subject was uh, surprisingly cooperative and uh, had no problem with uh, going to talk to uh, Martinez detectives. The man furnished Martinez police with a driver's license that seemed to confirm his name was Ural Wills. A check of his record revealed that three years earlier, in 1990, 
He was arrested for an armed robbery of a supermarket in Oakland, but was later acquitted. Despite the prior arrest, police had nothing linking the man to the Martinez bank robbery. They had no choice but to release him. They didn't know that uncovering the man's true identity would lead them to the bank robber who was willing to kill to escape police. In Martinez, California, a bank robber threatened employees' lives until he got what he came for. $35,000 in cash intended for the bank's ATM machines. Police searched for the suspect by following a trail of $20 bills near the crime scene until it ended in a residential cul-de-sac. For FBI Supervisory Special Agent Bob Moore, the end of the trail was itself a clue. Right, well, we don't have that yet. We're still waiting. The trail of $20 bills stopped there. So initially, we, we assumed that there had been a getaway car somewhere near that end of that cul-de-sac. Martinez police interviewed residents who lived in the ordinarily quiet suburban area. One homeowner said that earlier in the day he was working in his front yard. He noticed a brand new Jeep Cherokee speed past his home. He thought the white female behind the wheel might have been just a reckless teenager. The witness said the vehicle had no license plates, only a placard from a nearby Jeep dealership. Several other witnesses in the neighborhood also saw the vehicle, but none of them could agree on the Jeep's color. Okay, well, great. Well, thank you. I may call on you again. Supervisory Special Agent Bob Moore pursued the vehicle lead. Yes, Bob Moore with the FBI. He called the dealership advertised on the SUV and learned they sold over 60 new Jeep Cherokees in the past three months. We began identifying the people who had purchased those cars with uh, negative results. Each Jeep Cherokee had to be investigated. Martinez Police Commander Tom Simonetti knew it would be painstaking work. We also talked to several of the registered owners of new Jeeps, and they had either no criminal record or they had been out of town and were able to prove that they weren't involved in the robbery. We found that one had been stolen from a nearby BART station. The vehicle was recovered in the city of Concord, and after investigating it and processing it, it was determined that it was not involved in the uh, crime. The last two Jeeps that we looked at were both sold to a rental car company in the city of Antioch. This is what we have here. Anything else Agents the went to the rental company to investigate the last two vehicles. You can give me the rental paperwork. They requested copies of the rental contracts. They learned one of the Jeeps was rented the day before the robbery and returned the following evening. The name on the contract was one Ural Wills, the name used by the motorcyclist in the Martinez Bank parking lot, who was also the same man police observed making a 911 call near a Pleasant Hill supermarket. Martinez police needed to clear up the question of how Ural Wills could have simultaneously fled from the area in a Jeep and been spotted in the bank's parking lot as an onlooker. For answers, they turned to Officer Lauderdale. Uh -huh. Take a quick look at these. When I presented the picture of Ural Wills and in the photo lineup to Officer Lauderdale, he identified a different person as Ural Wills. Lauderdale picked the photo of Doug Jones, a known criminal associate of Ural Wills. In looking into Mr. Wills's 
criminal history, we determined that he had an accomplice who had committed several crimes with him. Detectives believe that the accomplice, Doug Jones, posed as Wills at the scene of the robbery to throw off police. They now considered Wills their prime suspect. To agents, it was clear why Jones made the call while the bank robbery was in progress. Yeah, that's who I contacted. The planning of this included the attempt to create a diversion of the police by making a 911 call to the Pleasant Hill Police Department. Martinez police ran a more detailed background check on Ural Wills. They spoke to the Oakland detectives that arrested him three years ago for a supermarket robbery. They expressed their frustration that he was later acquitted. Martinez commander Tom Simonetti learned of yet another recent arrest of Ural Wills. During this investigation, we had found that Mr. Wills had been arrested by the California Highway Patrol for carrying a loaded Glock pistol. Martinez police discovered that the bank robber also used a Glock pistol. Ballistics tests on the recovered bullets revealed that they were from a Glock 9 millimeter. Martinez investigators also learned from Oakland criminal informants that Wills often preyed on other criminals. He had made several armed robberies of known drug dealers in the city of Oakland, which led us to believe we were dealing with somebody who either wasn't afraid or was very brazen in his criminal activity. The same criminal informants gave police insight to Ural Wills' methods of operation. They said he often used female getaway drivers because Wills believed they were less suspicious to police. The fact that a woman was seen behind the wheel of the Jeep was consistent with Wills' criminal history. From the auto rental contracts, agents were able to trace Ural Wills' financial records. The Jeep Cherokee had been paid for with a credit card by Wills. We determined through uh, subpoenas that the credit card had been issued by a credit union in Berkeley. They also learned Wills had a savings account at the credit union, but found no unusually large deposits that could be linked to the Martinez bank robbery. We asked the employees at the credit union if he were to appear at the credit union to call the Berkeley Police Department. Thank you very much. Even without any suspicious bank deposits, agents and Martinez Police Commander Tom Simonetti still believed evidence implicated Wills in the bank robbery. Wills had an apartment in Antioch, California, 20 miles east of Martinez. Based on the information compiled by the Martinez Police Department, the FBI, and the Antioch Police Department, we were able to obtain a federal search warrant of Mr. Will's apartment in the city of Antioch. 30 days after the bank robbery, FBI agents and a police SWAT team prepared to execute the search warrant on Will's apartment. They knew he had already fired 10 rounds at a Martinez police officer. The SWAT team suspected Wills would shoot again. FBI agents and the Martinez police SWAT team were serving a search warrant on an apartment belonging to bank robbery suspect Ural Wills. They found one man in the apartment. The SWAT team quickly determined he was not Wills. They identified him as Doug Jones, who was a known criminal accomplice of Ural Wills, as well as Wills' roommate. Jones was the man seen making the 911 call near a supermarket before the Martinez bank robbery, and the man spotted in the bank parking lot after the robbery. Officers removed Jones from the apartment and took him to the station for questioning. 
As investigators executed their search warrant, they found several items of interest, including a bulletproof vest. Agents also found a red jacket that matched witness descriptions of the bank robber's clothing. In the bedroom, they identified a pair of sneakers as the type worn by the robber. They found an even more telling clue inside one of the shoes. $3,000, all in $20 bills. The stolen money from the Martinez bank was also entirely in $20 bills. The shoes were sent to the lab where the soles could be compared to a shoe print recovered from the Martinez bank robbery. Detectives also uncovered hospital bills that suggested Wills was injured on the day of the bank robbery. Martinez police commander Tom Simonetti followed up. Upon contacting the doctor at the hospital, he told us that Mr. Wills had told him that he slipped on a wet floor at a grocery store and broke his foot. The doctor, however, pointed out that the injury was more consistent with a hard impact, in particular a straight down impact from falling or dropping off something. Wills was further tied to the crime when analysts confirmed one of the shoes found in his apartment matched the shoe print taken at the scene of the Martinez robbery. At the police station, Where is Mr. Wills? agents questioned Wills' roommate and criminal associate, Doug Jones. As suspicious as Jones' actions were, police couldn't charge him with a crime or make him talk. If Jones knew where Wills was hiding, he wasn't telling investigators. The biggest frustration in this case was trying to locate Mr. Wills after he knew we were looking for him. 222, go ahead. We had searched his residence, we had contacted everybody that knew him, and there was no doubt he knew we were after him. Agents knew Wills was a career criminal and were certain he would strike again. They spent nearly a month searching Bay Area neighborhoods Wills was known to frequent. They found no sign of the violent fugitive. While investigators hunted for Wills, he was planning a crime even more ambitious than his Martinez bank robbery. He gathered a group of accomplices and filled them in on his plan. Four days before Christmas in 1993, Will's accomplices descended upon the Antioch, California home of jewelry store owner Gene Mayer and his wife, Ruth. They posed as detectives investigating credit card fraud. Once the door was opened, they revealed their sinister purpose. Two bound the couple with duct tape, while a third moved toward the back of the house to look for a safe. You guys stay quiet. Don't move. You won't get hurt. You got the safe? Good. Let's go. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. The men told Gene Mayer they were kidnapping his wife. They said they'd phone with the details on how he could retrieve her. Mayer could do nothing as Ural Will's accomplices left with his wife and a safe full of jewelry. They used Mrs. Mayer's Suburban as their getaway vehicle. Get in there. Let's go. Just 10 minutes later, Gene Mayer freed himself and called 911. Antioch police responded. 
The scene was supervised by Sergeant Scott Williford. When I arrived at the mayor residence, officers were in the process of cordoning off the crime scene with police tape and barriers. I went inside the residence and Gene Mayer was in the process of uh, being interviewed. He was uh, very traumatized. You've got to do it. Get after it. Detectives tried to focus Mr. Mayer on describing his wife's abductors, but he got only brief glances at them. As detectives processed the house for evidence, they discovered a ransom note. Mayer never saw the kidnappers leave it. The note warned him not to contact the authorities. Gene Mayer worried that he might have made a mistake by calling police. He feared the kidnappers would retaliate by killing his wife. To help find Mrs. Mayer, Antioch police requested assistance from the FBI. They searched for any sign of Ruth Mayer's Suburban that her abductors used as a getaway vehicle. Investigators knew the chances of finding a kidnapping victim alive diminish the longer the victim is held captive. Officers in Antioch and neighboring communities urgently scoured parking lots at shopping centers, thinking the kidnappers might have abandoned Mrs. Mayer's SUV and switched to another vehicle. They found nothing. Detectives learned that the jewelry in the stolen safe was worth $400,000. But Mr. Mayer wasn't concerned about the jewelry. He wanted his wife returned unharmed. Blindfolded during her abduction, Ruth Mayer had no idea where she was or what the kidnappers had in store for her. Bank robbery suspect Ural Wills used a team of accomplices to rob a jewelry store owner and kidnap his wife. Inside the Mayer home, Antioch police analyzed the ransom note left behind by the suspects. The kidnappers demanded $2 million for the safe return of Mrs. Mayer. Police anticipated they would phone with instructions. Technicians installed phone traps to trace and record any incoming calls. But none came. For more leads, Antioch Police Sergeant Scott Williford gathered details about the jewelry stolen from the house. If any of it turned up, it might put them on the trail of the kidnappers. Since Mr. Mayor was a jeweler, he had specific in detailed information on the description of all the jewelry. We were able to provide or compile a detailed list and put it out to other agencies regarding the stolen property. The FBI brought additional resources and helped coordinate the search for any sign of Mrs. Mayer or the Suburban her abductors stole from her driveway. By the following morning, investigators were still combing the mayor's neighborhood for clues. Teams of officers and agents began talking to people in the neighborhood we were, were knocking on doors asking if people had seen anything suspicious in the area. In addition to interviewing neighbors, investigators like Antioch Police Sergeant Scott Williford turned to the media for help. We did everything possibly that we could to get the information out to the public so we could have the public's assistance in trying to locate Ruth Mayer. Hundreds of volunteers distributed over 8,000 leaflets throughout the Bay Area. The leaflets had photos of Mrs. Mayer and a description of her suburban. The strategy quickly brought results. Within hours after the kidnapping, with the information put out to the other agencies, we located the suburban that was stolen. Technicians processed the vehicle for evidence. 
They found nothing useful. Investigators theorized that the kidnappers transferred Ruth Mayer to a second getaway vehicle. They took impressions of fresh tire tracks found at the scene. The impressions could be compared to the suspect's vehicle if it was found. Although they had found her vehicle, detectives still had no clue where Mrs. Mayer was being held. The kidnappers left her unattended for hours at a time. She used the opportunity to bite through her restraints. Mayer knew an escape attempt was too risky. Instead, she memorized the details of the garage in case she was ever asked to identify it. In the driveway, she saw the outline of a car. It was covered with a blue tarp. Mayer thought about shouting for help, but she was concerned what might happen if her abductors heard her. For the time being, she had no choice but to wait. Mr. Mayer quickly raised the money he hoped would bring his wife home. Wearing latex gloves, agents recorded the bill's serial numbers. They were prepared to make the drop as soon as they received instructions from the kidnappers. Two days after the kidnapping, police responded to a call from a Berkeley credit union. The FBI had asked the manager to call police if he saw the suspect from the Martinez bank robbery. He spotted Ural Wills trying to make a deposit. Like a song here? Bring up your account number. The teller tried to access the account, but it was frozen. Sometimes that works. Berkeley police arrived and calmly approached the bank, but Wills spotted them. As they frisked Wills, Berkeley police retrieved a loaded clip for a 9mm Glock pistol. They also found Wills had something else to hide. Located in his pocket was a key to a car. The police officers asked him where his car was parked. He denied owning a car. The officers then walked down the street checking vehicles until they located his vehicle. The keys in Wills' pocket fit a Ford Explorer. FBI Supervisory Special Agent Bob Moore searched the impounded vehicle for evidence that would link Wills to the Martinez bank robbery. Instead, he uncovered the first break in the Ruth Mayer kidnapping case. The key items of evidence found in the Ford Explorer the day of Wills' arrest were a cell phone, a weapon, a pager that belonged to Ural Wills, and a bag containing jewelry. Agents had previously thought the Ruth Mayer kidnapping and Martinez bank robbery cases were unrelated. All that changed when they discovered some of the jewelry was personalized. RM were the initials of Ruth Mayer. Agents showed the jewelry to Ruth Mayer's husband, who confirmed it was stolen from their home. Investigators now considered Wills a suspect both in the Ruth Mayer kidnapping and the Martinez bank robbery. To further tie Wills to the Martinez bank robbery, FBI technicians performed ballistics tests on the Glock handgun recovered from Wills' vehicle.
They compared the bullets test fired by the Glock in the lab to bullets recovered from the Martinez Bank crime scene. The tests indicated the bullets were not fired by the same gun. Investigators believed Wills probably disposed of the pistol used during the bank robbery and replaced it with another gun of the same make and model. All right, we found the jewels in your car. Right, I want to know where you were and what you were doing. Told Wills was no longer just a bank well, robbery suspect. He was also a suspect in the Ruth Mayer kidnapping. We can already connect you to Mrs. Mayer. What these jewels are doing in Desperate to save Mrs. Mayer's life, Antioch police asked Wills to tell them where she was being held. but Wills refused to cooperate. He remained silent on his involvement in the Ruth Mayer kidnapping. With Wills in jail, investigators were concerned his accomplices would panic and do something desperate. This kidnapping certainly exhibits some organization to it. And, but Authorities the held a press conference to appeal for new leads. They also warned Will's accomplices that they were closing in and that Mrs. Mayer should be released unharmed. On the other hand, I can't say for certain, but certainly we're looking at that. I've been here this whole time. Nobody's telling me nothing. On the fourth day of Mrs. Mayer's captivity, Christmas Eve, the man guarding Mrs. Mayer received instructions from the other accomplices in the kidnapping plot. His orders were to get rid of Mrs. Mayer any way he could. The man ordered her to stay down and out of sight while he drove. Mrs. Mayer couldn't be sure whether she was going to live or die. Kidnapping victim Ruth Mayer had endured four days of captivity. The ringleader of the abduction, Ural Wills, was in police custody on bank robbery charges. That left Wills' accomplices leaderless, and they were worried that the law was closing in. The accomplices ordered the man guarding Ruth Mayer to get rid of her any way he could. Thirty miles north of her Antioch, California home, where she was abducted, in a town called El Sobrante, the kidnappers decided to get rid of Mrs. Mayer by releasing her. Now, don't take off your blindfold. Antioch Police Sergeant Scott Williford believed police efforts to reach the kidnappers through the media paid off. Well, they knew the seriousness of the crime. They knew the pressure was on. This was a national publicized case at the time, and they didn't know what to do. It was so high profile. Everybody knew all the details of this, and they were forced to release her. News of Ruth Mayer's return made headlines and the local newscasts. I just want to say that I'm so, so very happy to be home. Anything that you can do. Investigators questioned Mrs. Mayer about her ordeal. She didn't know the location in which she was held and could not describe her abductors. Even so, she provided agents with important detail. She was able to use her senses as she was held in this garage and actually had remarkable recall as to a lot of the, the circumstances that were occurring in the area where she was held. She described certain sounds that she heard while she was held. She described the sound of trains going by. She described the sounds of buses or diesel-powered vehicles having to gear down or slow down as if to take a sharp turn. Now, we've gotten a fair amount Based on information obtained from Mrs. Mayer, investigators were looking for a location near train tracks and major bus lines. They used the cell phone seized in Will's vehicle to narrow the search. Agents quickly obtained the phone's billing records and they just make their way heading east. 
They concentrated on calls Wills made around the time of Mrs. Mayer's kidnapping. We were able to track the cell phone usage and determine where it had been in use the prior night, including in Antioch and as well as the numbers uh, that, that it had called that night. Investigators learned towers in West Contra Costa County picked up Will's cell phone signal on the evening of the kidnapping. They began looking for streets in Contra Costa County where train tracks and major bus lines intersected. Based on Mrs. Mayer's observations, agents were looking for any home that had a vehicle covered with a blue tarp in the driveway. We located the house in San Pablo, and just from the visual inspection outside, it matched the criteria and the description that Ruth Mayer gave us. Agents obtained a search warrant for the home and found no one inside. This is the Mrs. Mayer identified the garage as the place in which she was held. Agents wanted to question the home's owner, but they were unable to locate him. Investigators sought out homeowner's relatives in an effort to find him. Edward Rodriguez was the homeowner's nephew. Agents were unaware that he guarded Ruth Mayer during the kidnapping. But Rodriguez mistakenly believed the agents were looking for him and said he was just about to turn himself in. Investigators found Rodriguez remorseful about the part he played in the kidnapping and convinced him to cooperate. Ultimately, the guard confessed to the whole crime, confessed to the planning, the details of the operation, and laid out the, um, the whole crime from A to Z. Rodriguez named all the conspirators in the scheme. Anybody else here? He said Ural Wills planned and led the kidnapping operation. Agents corroborated the guard's statements with Will's cell phone records. They later apprehended all the conspirators. Brian Tomasello, one of the gunmen that burst into the mayor's home, was found guilty on six counts of robbery and kidnapping and sentenced to life in prison. Edward Rodriguez was found guilty of kidnapping and robbery. The jury gave him a short eight-year sentence because he released Mrs. Mayer. Before he could be tried for the Ruth Mayer kidnapping, Ural Wills was found guilty of the Martinez bank robbery and was sentenced to 39 years. Prosecutors learned that Wills was suffering from kidney failure. Doctors gave him less than 10 years to live. Wills was certain to die in prison. He's having serious kidney. Prosecutors informed Mrs. Mayer of their plans not to try him for her kidnapping. She's a forgiving person. She knew justice was served. She knew he was in custody, Mr. Wills, for the rest of his life. And I believe that she forgave everybody. As he pursued his violent schemes, Ural Wills had expected to make millions and live a life of luxury. Instead, the FBI and local police made sure the criminal's last days were spent behind bars.